welcome to our session on AI and content governance that's hosted by the OACE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, specifically by the Office of the Representative on Freedom of the Media, which also um, uh, explains a bit the regional speakers we are mainly having here today. Um, and we will be discussing free speech safeguards for digital information spaces during times of crisis. Crisis in a broad sense, meaning conflict, COVID, and climate. This session is hybrid, meaning we have two speakers here um, with me in Addis and two additional ones joining online. Um, to my left, we have Ilishka Pirkova, who is the Global Freedom of Expression Lead at Access Now. Um, and we worked a lot um, in together in our project to put a spotlight on AI and the impact of AI on freedom of expression, um, including on the policy manual that um, I also brought for you here, physical copies, um, and that we will um, introduce a little bit later. And they're also doing phenomenal work on content governance and also content governance in crisis, which we will be hearing more about later. And to my right is um, Mara Aselmat, who is technology and women's rights expert at ACP. Um, and online, we have Matthias Ketteman, who is Professor for Innovation and Law at the University of Innsbruck, and Tatiana Avdieva, who is Human Rights Lawyer at the Digital Security Lab in Ukraine. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Denise Wagner, who is co-moderating -moder online. Before we dive into the discussions, I would like to hand over the floor to our director, Jürgen Heisel, who um, will kindly replace the representative who is currently on the road to the Ministerial Council um, in Poland um, for his opening remarks. Uh, Jürgen, you have the floor. We cannot hear you. Can you hear us? I'm not sure this works. Okay, we seem to have now a... My video is also black. My video is also black. But we can hear you, but we, we cannot see you, you even though the camera is... Okay, we are having technical issues as with any online session. Apologies for that. Maybe we'll just give it one more try and otherwise I think we will... Denise, you can hear us, right? Can you try? We can hear you, but we're having some technical difficulties with the video. Apologies for that. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you, but we only have a black screen. Maybe the technicians in the back can help with that. The screen of the speaker is only black. Can you maybe help enabling the video? And in the meantime, I will, while they are trying to fix this, um, sorry? Yes? Ah, okay. It, they say it's on your side. But do you want to briefly speak without the screen on or should we just move on? Thank you, Julia. I think since we only have one hour for this whole event and I, I really have to apologize to everybody for this uh, slight problem caused by technology. It's connecting us, but not always perfectly. Um, but I think we should start right away uh, to not lose any time. So uh, let me all uh, wish you all a very good afternoon from Vienna. And uh, I'm very happy to be connected with you at least uh, through this channel. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this year marks uh, the 25th anniversary of the mandate of the RFOM's office. It was 25 years ago on, that only 1.7 million, 1.7 percent uh, of the global population was online. Today, that number has risen to more than 80 percent across the OSCE region. This monumental expansion, with all its benefits for the free flow of information as well as human rights concerns, such as surveillance, cyber crimes, or the spread of disinformation, has profoundly changed the way we seek, receive, and impart information at all times, but particularly also during crisis. Moreover, we have seen a monopolization online with a handful of online platforms having become powerful gatekeepers to our information. They deploy machine learning technologies and AI to govern online spaces. 
AI is used to decide on which content is taken down, what content is prioritized, or to whom it is disseminated, at what point in time. These decisions that shape and arbitrate political and public discourse are executed by technology that is not necessarily designed for accuracy, diversity, or the public good. This year, more than ever, it is undeniable that the way online information is curated and moderated has a direct and significant impact on global peace, stability, and comprehensive security. Over the last couple of years, we have witnessed how the uh, amplification of disinformation and hate speech online can impact individual lives and whole societies during health crisis or during war, often in irreparable ways. Content governance has to put human rights at the center. This matters at all times, but becomes even more essential in times of crisis. We have to work together through multi-stakeholder and multilateral efforts, such as the one here at the IGF, to make sure that the gatekeepers to information and their business practices are in line with international human rights standards. With power, must come responsibility. Earlier this year, the Office of the Representative on Freedom of the Media launched a publication putting a spotlight on artificial intelligence and free speech, a policy manual, which aims at ensuring that the use of technology and artificial intelligence is conducive to our digital rights. In order to achieve this, the policy manual provides human rights-centric recommendations and free speech safeguards for the use of AI in content governance basic guidelines that are needed to preserve and foster the internet as a space for democratic participation and representation, for media freedom and for security. The recommendations build on the principles of transparency, accountability, inclusiveness and public oversight. Without those, we cannot have freedom of expression in the digital realm. In today's crisis-ridden world, it is necessary to discuss the context of crisis. A few weeks ago, the Office of the Representative held a workshop on content governance in times of crisis. The way in which content is governed can fuel tensions, incite violence, and suppress independent, accurate information. But technology can also empower communities and enable access to independent information. This is relevant throughout the entire crisis cycle and irrespective of the type of crisis, be it conflict, climate change, or COVID. The workshop came out with a few key messages around preparation, due diligence safeguards, crisis protocols, and inclusive processes in view of ensuring healthy and vibrant information spaces. In the next hour, we will have an opportunity to discuss these points and to validate them based on your input and feedback. As a next step, we will then present them to the OSCE participating states as policy guidance. Thank you very much for joining us today and helping us to get one step closer to solid policy policies to enable and protect our human rights online at all times. I'm very much looking forward to discussions and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jürgen. Um, and apologies again that the video did not work. Um, the recommendations you mentioned, we brought a few copies of the policy manual also here and I will put it in the chat for those online later. Um, they are, as, as Jürgen just mentioned, really focusing on the key principles around transparency, inclusiveness, um, accountability, public oversight, um, and they're really crucial for ensuring online freedom of expression at all times. But over the course of the last month or even years, we have seen that um, in particular when we are at times of, of social uprising or of tensions or conflict, um, but also other crises, like for example the global pandemic or also other um, health crises or natural disasters or climate um, crisis, it's even more important that we are able to access independent information, that we can communicate freely um, and that we can really use the internet, all of us, um, as a space, as an inclusive information space. Um, the right to, of society to know and to be informed becomes even Bless more you. important. Um, it is important um, to discuss content governance in times of crisis, I think especially also at this IGF, also because we know that it is being hosted in a country where millions of people are being um, currently um, not able to access the internet because it is being shut down. Um, so we are very much looking forward to the conversation here. Um, as Jürgen already mentioned, we a few weeks ago um, hosted a workshop that uh, looked at the recommendations that we published earlier this year on key principles on content governance, 
generally to see how they are applicable in the context of crisis. Um, because it's really about the availability of information, the accessibility of public interest content and the administration and flow of information. During the workshop we identified key five key points that we want to discuss today and we really want to open up then also to all of you to receive input and feedback before we are finalizing this as policy guidance um, to the states. And speaking about the state, we um, I want already to dive in um, and hand over to our first speaker who is online and I very much hope that it's possible um, to enable the camera now with the technical support. Um, Matthias Kettemann, who was the rapporteur of the workshop and was moderating the conversation during that workshop. Um, Matthias, um, could you maybe tell us a bit about the state's positive obligation to protect but also to fulfill and to ensure freedom of expression online, including in times of crisis? Um, could you please enable the speaker's microphone and camera? It's still disabled. Thank you very much. There are two speakers online. I put their names in the chat. I'm unfortunately also not able to enable it. But while you're figuring out the technology, I will maybe um, <laughs> make use of the um, privilege of having two speakers also here physically in the room so that we do not uh, lose more time and we will speak about the specific roles of states later and now move to you, Eliska, um, and also um, the role of platforms and the role of preparing for um, crisis. Um, I see that Matthias is now up, so if you don't mind, I will still start with the <laughs> states. Thanks. So, Matthias, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks for the tech people for enabling, uh, uh, well, tech. This goes to show the power of infrastructure. And this is one of the topics that we've uh, talked about um, during our, our discussion of the different obligations of states and of companies with regard to the use of AI uh, in, in content uh, governance. So uh, I'll focus on the states first. States, we know that, uh, and Julia just uh, mentioned that again, states have an obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill their human rights obligations, including the right to freedom of opinion and expression in the digital as in the offline world. It is their task, therefore, to enact an effective set of rules, making it possible for individuals to enjoy their human rights, and making platforms stick to human rights. They have to enforce human rights also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, third parties. Now, specifically with regards to um, AI in, in content moderation, especially in crisis situations, um, we've highlighted uh, a number of important points. Namely, states have to make sure that the overall media structure uh, in their countries enables uh, democratic discourse to emerge Democratic discourse is extremely important before and during the time of the internet. Um, in addition to a fixed set of rules, um, any any policy shocks caused by crisis have to be um, cushioned by uh, flanking effects, uh, by uh, laws, by um, uh, uh, rules that make sure that uh, uh, crisis situations do not fundamentally challenge the, the media landscape. Now, specifically with regards to um, AI, we have to, and, and content governance in crisis, we have to ensure that we differentiate between short term, mid term, and long term crisis. In short term crisis, platforms have to oblige platforms, states have to oblige platforms to take measures that are particularly fast and effective measures such as what happens if uh, companies fail to do that just a couple uh, of, of hours ago uh, videos from the Christchurch massacre re-emerged on Twitter because Twitter uh, is now failing to um, take those down effectively and their AI has been uh, reconfigured states have an obligation to ensure that platforms um, meet their their human rights obligations um, in a uh, long term and uh, situations states have to uh, oblige platforms to provide uh, crisis protocols um, in order to assess the risks which they systematically have for information flows 
and to make sure that this crisis protocol uh, foresees specific parameters uh, used to determine which particular exceptional circumstances exist, uh, the role of each stakeholder and the action they need to take, clear procedures for determining when to activate such a protocol, and safeguards to avoid adverse effects. Um, these are um, important elements which are contained for uh, the European Union's legal field in the Digital Services Act. We counsel that states generally adapt, adopt them. Um, the establishment of efficient, of sustainable, of proportionate crisis protocols and transparency rules in accordance with this manual OSC has been working on is important to ensure human rights, including during crisis situations. Those rules would be most effective if they were built on multi-stakeholder engagement and close coordination with civil society, including oversight and accountability mechanisms. States have an important role in that regard. They have, and I end with that again, because it can't be said often enough, states have online and offline the obligation to respect, protect and implement human rights vis-a-vis -vis platforms because their citizens deserve their rights also when they're online. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Matthias, for this really excellent overview of all the different obligations um, and, and really referring to the regulatory framework that states should be in place to ensure that our rights are being protected online. Um, I want to pick up on one thing that you mentioned that is very important, um, which is that crises, of course, are different and, and require different responses, but they, we have some identified some similarities like short and mid and long term crisis or also impacts of crisis. Um, and specifically looking at before crisis and trying to identify already early warning signals or things um, when we could see how content governance and automated content governance could be used to identify early on when there are crises uh, involving and what the risks are. And um, when we look at, at due diligence safeguards and all these issues that we heard about, um, where we have obligations by the states, but also, of course, by private actors. Eliska, can you give us a little bit more information on, on risk assessments, due diligence, and also the declaration that I think Access Now just launched a few minutes ago? Thank you so much, and it's a great pleasure to uh, be here, just briefly introduce uh, who Access Now is for those who did not encounter our work. We are international human rights organizations that protect and defend uh, human rights of online users at risk around the world, and it's a great pleasure to be here. We operate in several world regions where we work on the policy as well as advocacy efforts towards protection of human rights in online environment. And indeed, this is a very timely panel. Uh, apologies for arriving a little bit late. We just launched our uh, declaration of principles on platform governance and content governance during the time of crisis that we have been developing together with our partners in um, pretty much last six months through different process of consultation and call drafting exercise. Um, and I couldn't agree more with what Matthias already flagged, and that's that human rights obligation of states uh, to also keep human rights in the core of platform accountability, platform responsibility, and content governance in general. And while our declaration is specifically targeting social media companies, the complementarity between the actions and regulatory responses of states, their respect for the rule of law and human rights, and consequently more self-regulatory action of platforms go hand in hand and inform each other. Um, and we actually also see that on platforms often inconsistent responses to situation of crisis in different parts of the world where we can clearly uh, trace uh, how platforms respond in countries where they are under significant regulatory and public pressure um, and how their adequate response or crisis response mechanism lags behind in countries uh, predominantly in the global south, countries that are not western or considering big markets where they of course have a huge interest in keeping their reputation because of the profit. Um, and there are a number of examples where Access Now uh, could identify these issues including the latest illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia, where uh, applications of different carve-outs from content governance uh, policies of platforms were communicated in a very non-transparent manner. And at the same time, these ongoing invasion actually showed how quickly platforms are able to respond uh, and how they uh, neglectfully 
um, like behind with adequate response in other situations of crisis that are maybe not in such a public eye or not on under so much pressure. So um, maybe a little bit about the logic that we used when we created the declaration that is now available on our official website. And I also want to emphasize that this is a collaborative effort together with our partner organizations, including Article 19, Center for Democracy and Technology, Mnemonic, uh, but also uh, organizations that directly operate in situation of crisis. Um, we uh, were thinking about what kind of measures platforms should comply with before, during, and in the aftermath of a uh, crisis. Um, and uh, this is not to say that in our view there is ever any hard end of crisis. Crisis has a very complex and complicated life cycle. And so these monitoring measures and different mitigating of risk measures have to be put in place continuously by platforms. Um, and uh, you specifically asked me about the uh, how to actually prevent the crisis. So what are the measures that companies could and should put in place prior to crisis? Um, so we definitely put a lot of emphasis on human rights due diligence safeguards um, that of course first and foremost include, especially at the level before the crisis escalate, uh, the meaningful engagement with trusted partners on the ground, civil society organization and other independent stakeholders that operate in the country and understand the context of the country very well and can identify the first sign of possible escalation um, uh, pretty accurately from the very start and we as a civil society organization ourselves often experience that this engagement uh, doesn't really exist or there are no proper cooperation mechanism that would actually lead to proper follow-up on uh, how our recommendations were implemented by platforms and whether in any way they actually inform terms of service or content governance policies of platforms in order to mitigate the risk stemming from their systems and processes, including algorithmic content moderation and content curation, which plays crucial role in a way how you're able to access information in general and especially during the time of crisis number of recommendations that you can see in the declaration then depart from the human rights due diligence principles as defined by the United Nations guiding principles as well as number of our international bodies and there is a significant body of work done this topic that we reviewed and did our best to include in the declaration um, but especially uh, in the context of crisis, these have to be designed again in a way that they are able to address life cycle of the crisis, the situation of conflict, and also the human vulnerabilities that are uh, essentially connected to situation of crisis and should come first. And I couldn't agree with the point that Matthias has already made, and that's to develop crisis protocols across all level and likelihood of risks that are designed to prevent and mitigate potential harm that stems for platform systems and processes. Um, and this should be actually done not on an ad hoc basis, as we often see, not in a non-transparent manner, uh, that we don't have even proper information what kind of crisis protocols platforms really use and on what basis, but this should be done actually prior to the escalation of the crisis. Um, when a uh, number of issues uh, that then result in rather short-sighted solutions can be pre-mitigated and the effectiveness of these measures then can be naturally much higher. Um, and before I will uh, give you back the mic, um, I also want to go maybe back to the um, point that Matthias raised already and that's human rights obligations of states and why they are so important in the context of platform governance, especially during the time of crisis. Um, international human rights framework is legally binding framework um, and uh, we often see uh, states uh, in pretty much all across the world to abuse platforms for their own political agenda, whether this is a state-sponsored uh, propaganda, disinformation, uh, hate speech, incitement to violence and so on and so forth. Um, and we also know how crucial role these platforms play during, especially during the time of crisis, when they are often the last resort uh, where individuals and groups can seek any form of remedy or redress or simply uh, measures and tools how to feel secure and safe in the online environment. Um, 
And uh, gradually, Access Now has been monitoring a number of cases how uh, states uh, abuse this vulnerable position of platforms in situation of crisis, uh, either more specifically through uh, blocking individual platforms, it's a targeted blocking of communication, uh, and especially social media, but also through internet shutdown. And Julia very nicely pointed out uh, how uh, damaging for human rights protection and people's safety internet shutdowns can be, especially during the time of crisis when adequate access to information saves lives. We gradually see the states around the world to quote the spread of this information and hate speech as a justification for these kind of um, uh, very strong and negative measures. Um, and especially in times of crisis, uh, to name few countries such as, for instance, Azerbaijan or Kazakhstan, that are also participa participating state of OSCE, uh, uh, actually perform internet shutdown precisely during the time of crisis. We also monitor the longest internet shutdowns in the history that are currently occurring in the world, and that's Pakistan, that's Tigray region in Ethiopia, Myanmar, and Kashmir. And we couldn't emphasize more uh, the importance of adequate access to information and how damaging for human safety internet shutdowns are in a long-term run. Um, and I think this is also very closely connected to importance of uh, platforms and technologies uh, in the context of crisis um, and how fragile and or how easily abused these platforms or by states can be uh, if we don't have proper due diligence safeguards in, in place in a long-term run. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ilishka. There is so much there to, to unfold again especially I think the role of states in ensuring rights, but at the same time is that also regulation by states, of course, unfortunately, we have seen repeatedly um, can be problematic or have also been misused. Um, I want to touch upon one thing that, that you mentioned where I also saw that Tatiana, our next speaker, has heavily nodded um, into the camera, which is this whole discussion about um, meaningful engagement and, and engagement with civil society in the local context specifically. This is relevant, as you pointed out, in the pre-phases of crisis, but of course also continuously um, when there is a conflict or a crisis situation. Um, and Tatiana, of course, you are um, um, based in Ukraine and you have the very specific um, example of the uh, war against Ukraine currently um, going on. Um, can you maybe point to, to this collaboration that is needed during crisis and, and why it's so important to have trusted partners, um, but to also have a coordination with the platforms directly and what kind of like the framework for such collaboration would need to be to ensure that there is a constant and continuous risk assessment that, that leads to mitigation of um, challenges um, and that can really improve the access to information online, but also the communication of everybody in difficult times. Thanks. Thank you very much and also thanks to the previous speakers who made the great outline and mapped all the important issues we would discuss today. Uh, my name is Tatiana Avdeva. I'm a human rights lawyer currently based in Kyiv and serving as a legal counsel for Digital Security Lab Ukraine. We're working on advancing a human rights based online environment through promotion of uh, enhancement of policies of the private sector companies and also promotion of the legislative changes in Ukraine. Uh, as regards the question on the agenda regarding the co cooperation and collaboration between various stakeholders, I think that it's very important for the platforms to first of all develop the criteria based on which the stakeholders are chosen, picked up for cooperation and make those criteria publicly available for actually the review by the independent uh, civil society experts uh, and other individuals. Why is that important? Because actually a multi-stakeholder approach to formation of the policies implies not only engagement with civil society, but also at least uh, attempts to build the dialogue with various states especially in context of crisis. And now speaking not only about the armed conflict, but like various crises we have recently experienced, for instance, the one related to disinformation in the COVID times. And in this respect, it is important, for example, to uh, remember that the states, although they're sometimes in most cases perceived as being biased, 
are still very important actors, especially in cases such as now happening in Ukraine, when uh, Russian illegal invasion influenced not only physical facilities, but also the information environment and information space, especially in such areas as social media. And here it's important to take into account uh, such criteria as human rights, protection index of the states, level of involvement in the armed conflict. For example, the clear distinction shall be made by the platforms between aggressor states, defendant states, and third parties. As we know, many states are now distributing information, for example, on refugees, although they are not directly involved in the armed conflict itself. Uh, also, it is important to outline such stakeholders as media who are constantly trying to depict information pertaining to armed conflict, and therefore sometimes they become victims of uh, false positives and false negatives of the artificial intelligence in terms of blocking policies, when they're, for example, publishing the images of victims of violence, rape, murders, and so on which de facto is a legitimate content and shall be preserved as in evidence. And finally, indeed, it is civil society. Uh, and for them, it is important to note that organizations have to be independent, uh, politically neutral, and aware of the regional context or local context. Uh, it is particularly important uh, because sometimes social media are trying to look for bigger, let's say, stakeholders, um, who are organizing regional hubs or who are international organizations, uh, which although deal with the issues in a particular region, are not very specifically aware of the peculiarities of the situation at stake. Um, why engagement is needed in, at all? I think it's like quite a general question to be asked in such circumstances, but it is very important one because one of the most evident reasons is language. Not all stakeholders, uh, not, not all social media platforms actually know the local language. We had the case of Myanmar, where uh, really the crisis in moderation of Mata happened, and which was further confirmed by the independent fact-finding mission in 2018. But only knowledge of language is not enough. And that's very important to remember, because, for example, the person from Canada knowing Ukrainian most probably will not be aware of the semantic peculiarities and the specific words, euphemisms, which are used in the context of the armed conflict to replace certain words and to go through the algorithms without being banned. And it is very important to have people being engaged who directly deal with the cases um, which happen on the ground. And also, it is important to engage the local communities to anticipate threats. And here I wanted to say that one of the probably biggest flows in the work of social media before war in Ukraine, before full-scale invasion in Ukraine in 2022, was that they tried to maintain reactive rather than proactive approach, namely react upon the cases which are already happening, react upon the crisis, depending on the peculiarities of the crisis, but when it already develops. The main task now uh, is to develop the proactive approach, and here I absolutely agree with the uh, provisions of the declaration to which I was very lucky to be able to contribute, that we have to contribute to the development of the crisis protocols and work on enhancing the human rights protection framework, not only during and after crisis, like making conclusions, but also before they start, in order to enable the fastest possible reaction and in order to mitigate the risks. I would probably stop here as of now and give the floor back to Julia. Thank you so much. <coughs> Apologies. Thank you so much for this overview. I mean, um, again, so many points that, that we could follow up to. Um, I think it's really important what you pointed out now also in the end is as saying that we need to be, we need to ensure proactive responses, um, which also links to what you how you started your presentation with saying we need clear criteria that are developed in inclusive manners, that are developed transparently, um, and 
that are kind of like the same and applied in the same one uh, manner irrespective of the crisis and the context and ensuring that there is this contextualization with regard to the nuances, the language and the cultural um, issues. Um, I want to now move to kind of like the post-crisis context because this, this is something that we have not so much focused on yet, but at the same time, I think what came out of the conversation so far is really this, this need to assess and anticipate risks before they're kind of developing into violations of free speech and, and human rights online um, from both sides, from the sides of uh, businesses, online platforms, and from the side of states. But if we look also at when crisis or conflicts are, are kind of like dissolving a little bit or when we're in a phase of reconciliation, there of course are continuous um, challenges. And we know this also from the offline world and when we speak for example also of, of the inclusion of, of women in, in peace building efforts and all these kind of issues. So if we look at the digital sphere, this of course also provides a possibility for more inclusion if content governance um, would not replicate kind of the biases from the offline world or in a worst case scenario even amplify them. Um, so from from a gender perspective specifically but not only looking at this kind of like post um, crisis situation and I think this is important especially while we are now in the 16 days um, uh, campaign uh, against violence against women um, what is kind of like needed to ensure that content governance and specifically automated content governance can help reconciliate um, and can help um, rebuild communities and really help building peace and comprehensive security in the long term. Marwa, please. Thank you and hi everyone. I'll try to be brief to give the floor to the audience as well. Um, I think the reality today is that conflict is gendered, of course, because at the end of the day, the people who sustain our communities, they're women and young people. They're really at the front lines of the conflict. They're trying to, um, they're trying to, to help their communities at a local level, but also at, at a regional level. But what is currently happening is that most of states, they really react from an emergency perspective. So just after a war breaks out, then we need to find out what are the solutions that we, we should implement which doesn't really work because it's really emergency driven and at the end of the day, we need to sustain the efforts. Um, so the outlook is that we have a lot of frameworks in different parts of the world, such as cybersecurity frameworks, but they're not really looking into how different people experience um, online spaces. Because again, at the end of the day, um, someone from sub-Saharan Africa wouldn't really experience the internet as someone from Northern Europe. And this is something that online platforms have a hard time understanding. Um, and unfortunately, the reality check is that today some wars are really worthwhile than others. And um, online platforms are being more selective in the way they choose which war is more, um, yeah, is, is more worth of their interests and, and, and the way they deal with it. Um, as we've seen in Myanmar, we've seen in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, the way social media platforms reacted wasn't the way they reacted, for instance, in Ukraine. Um, and the fact is that today we have uh, content governance that is not rooted in the local um, yeah, in, in the local context. A lot of content moderations that are hired, they're again hired in an emergency perspective. Um, they're trained in a week to understand the conflict, to understand the perspectives of different people. A um, lot of community guidelines, they're not really even translated into local languages. So it was really a long fight with online uh, platforms to have guidelines in Swahili, Arabic, other dialects uh, from, for instance, the continent here, since the IGF is in Ethiopia today. So um, it's really important to push for more local contextualities when we talk about content governance today. And I think, Again, like going back to the post-crisis, 
um, we, we really need to, to think more expensively about conflict in a digital age. Because at the end of the day, once the conflict starts offline, it also starts online. And there is a lot of weaponization of data that is related to sexual reproductive health, data that is related to survivors of rape, data that is related to women's human rights defenders, um, and to really um, other defenders that are um, at risk. They risk their lives, and unfortunately, we don't always have um, yeah, the, the capacity to, to help in that sense. There is also um, the issue of um, having refugees, people fleeing wars, that end up not being traceable. They, they're not, they, don't, they don't have a data. We can't really um, help them access to um, really vital services. So this is something to think about um, in the context of, again, like peace and security and it's also a recommendation for governments to think about security within a development approach that is centered around human rights. I know it sounds a lot, but at the end of the day, if we just keep thinking about security tenets as really the state and the national cybersecurity framework, we wouldn't really be able to provide services that look for what is happening on the ground. Um, and we end up having people without papers, without access to services that are being threatened, that are being subject to sexual human trafficking that starts off online, that are being also subject to online extremism and terrorism. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's really a comprehensive outlook that should be taken when it comes to conflict settings. And we need to, again, have this conversation about global solidarity when it comes to having conflicts in the global north versus the global south, because the reality is, is still striking. And the way, again, social media platforms um, work with some settings is not similar or equal, or they're not really invested um, in a lot of regions where not only we deal with conflict, but we also deal with a lot of um, issues pertaining to social justice and, and inequalities. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I think two things that I want to really um, kind of re-emphasize because you put them so nicely is I think that online and offline are not two separate spaces, but it's really so connected nowadays that online violence and offline violence is, is closely interlinked. Um, and there's more than enough evidence for that, unfortunately. And the second point is that content governance needs to be rooted in human rights and in local context. So I think this is really crucially important. So thanks for making this point. Um, with this, I want to open the floor. We still have 15 minutes. So if there are questions or comments here in the floor, uh, in the room, but also online, and my colleague Denise will be helping if there is additional um, comments from, from our online participants. Um, if there is, or while you are still thinking about questions and, and your comments, I will start with one um, that came up um, earlier when we were discussing about also another aspect that I think is relevant in the, in the context of um, content governance and specifically crisis, is that we heard that often um, the current um, kind of like AI build information spaces are leveraged by information operations, that information is being weaponized, that disinformation is spread online, which is at the same time kind of an early warning sign of, of conflict or crisis in many contexts. So I want to touch upon this, and I think that Tatiana, you also mentioned this before, so maybe I, I would ki uh, kindly ask you to, to first take the floor, but then also open up to, to other panelists. Um, how can kind of like content governance and also automated content governance be be addressing this phenomenon and this problem without constraining rights, but rather kind of being conducive to inclusive conversation and digital rights of all? Thank you for the question. I consider it being particularly important and actually it will be built upon my previous intervention, uh, of course it shall be addressed with the cooperation with the local actors because actually the problem was weaponization of information, various information operations lies in the fact that they are usually 
started long before the crisis, any type of crisis actually emerges. Uh, and also those types of information, those pieces of news say can be very, let's say, virgin looking from the first glance, namely the wording of the um, messages delivered can be relatively neutral, but the amount of such information and the scope of its distribution, that's what really matters, and that's what really makes the impact of the weaponized information significant. Um, of this particular point of time, I would like to provide you the example from the war in Ukraine and how it actually started. Uh, for example, legal concepts and legal narratives are now weaponized and are now manipulated. Almost three examples, like the concept of failed state, which is used by Russia against Ukraine, the concept of responsibility to protect by which the illegal invasion is tried to be justified, and the concept of genocide, which is misapplied to the actions of Ukrainian authorities and actually by which Russia tries to justify its illegal invasion. Um, when we are speaking of disinformation, namely absolutely, like absolutely uh, misleading facts, which can harm particular audience, that's one issue. But when we are speaking about misinterpretation of the legal concepts, the issue is much more difficult. Uh, why is it important and why it relates to platforms? Because actually platforms have to deal with the avalanches of content, which also contains those manipulations, misinterpretation of legal concepts, misinterpretation of historical facts and events. And here, first of all, they have directly cooperated with the local stakeholders. Secondly, they have to have really good lawyers. And also uh, one of the probably most important pieces of advice from my side is for the platforms not to wait until International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, or any other international judicial institutions provides its decision, but to start reacting like when the problem appears, just because otherwise it will grow in its size and be absolutely devastating for human rights. And also platforms, uh, and probably that would be the last remark from my side, they should not initiate corporations themselves when they see that the problem exists, but they shall be open to cooperation whenever their local stakeholders and local partners see the problem or anticipate the problem appearing. Because when the platforms cooperate only when they want to or only when they consider it necessary to cooperate. It means that they're already late because when they see the problem, it means it already exists. While local partners can indicate the problem when it either does not exist at all and is only anticipated or it is in its early stages. Thank you for your attention and looking for the feedback from my colleagues. Thanks, Do you wanted to add something? Are there, in the meantime, any questions or comments from the floor? Yes, I see two, so maybe we will three, and then we will take them, and then um, we will hand back. Is there another microphone? Ah, yes, okay. Thanks. Shall I, shall I go? <laughs> Sorry. Hi, um, my name is Jacqueline Rowe, and I'm from Global Partners Digital. Um, thank you so much to the panelists for this discussion so far. My question... Um, relates to, we've spoken a lot about state responsibilities and the responsibilities of major online platforms, but I wanted to ask the panelists um, what they think the role of third party content moderation software providers are, and um, whether that's a step in the right direction in terms of uh, creating more locally sensitive content moderation, and perhaps touching on what the EU DSA says about interoperability in that direction, but also wondering to what extent does that provide a cop-out for platforms then to not integrate those functions internally. So I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts on the balance between those two. Thanks. Thank you so much. We don't have too much time left, so I will collect the questions. Can you maybe, uh, we have here in the first row, and then over here, and then on that side. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Tesfaino. I am from uh, Ethiopia, for Federal Judiciary. Thank you for the uh, panelists. It's a good presentation. And I want to uh, be clear on uh, 
this internet shut down um, be because uh, I think internationally this freedom of expression has some limitations. Even UDHR in these conventions, ICPR has put some limitations in using the rights. If there is a proportionality, necessity, if it's good for the democracy, then uh, there should be some limitations. Uh, as you have uh, pinpointed clearly that uh, there was uh, an internet shutdown in Ethiopia, especially in the northern part because of this crisis, and uh, how we should uh, balance the effect of uh, uh, shutdown with the protection of other public interest rights. If we simply open it, then it may have uh, uh, very uh, big problems. If we simply close it, then it has also its own problems. Therefore, uh, what is the balance in the proportionality for this uh, to, 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 to exercise? Thank you. Thank you for this um, comment. We will also respond to that, but I will still take the question over here. And then two more, and I think we can go five minutes over, but we will have to be very quick. Thank you. My name is Liz Orembo, a research fellow at Research ST Africa and also a trustee at Kicktanet. Um, I'd like to talk uh, about um, the regional comparison. I don't know if anyone has looked at it in terms of content, content moderation. Um, uh, we are doing research on, uh, on content moderation and what we're realizing is that the African region is receiving very less attention in terms of reporting. Yes, it's a, it's a problem across the bro board that there's no enough transparency I in such that uh, when content is moderated, the, the person whose content is moderated is not given sufficient information. But even when you look at the transparency reports, there's no disaggregated data or deleted data about Africa itself. Uh, for instance, uh, Twitter, TikTok, uh, just all of them, but also political reporting also. You can find Google has um, specific reporting on political advertising on some regions, but none of the countries in Africa. Uh, and yet, there's so much influence, uh, and especially of foreign actors in Kenya uh, in uh, African elections. I'll not go deeper, but I'd just like uh, you to contribute to that. Thanks, yes, very important point because it's the same also for the resources being spent um, for fighting disinformation. I think I here, another question, a comment, and then one last on the side. Hi, uh, my name is Ilham Mahmoud. I am from Veneto. Uh, my question is about deep fakes and uh, in accordance with the situation of conflict the security environment and the vulnerability of platforms. What's your suggestion on that? Thank you, and can you maybe hand over the microphone to us? Uh, sorry. To the, yes, exactly. Thank you so much. And then it will be very easy for our panelists to address all these very important points in two minutes. Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Juliana. I'm from the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And well, we have seen that uh, there's no previsibility and stability in the enforcement of uh, uh, platform rules or pl platform policies during this uh, emergency state. And so, would in this in this emergency state would be uh, would uh, con emergency constitution with uh, that establishes ex ante uh, procedures and also gives. Um, more em emergency powers to platforms uh, be adequate to to address this these problems, or it could just like surge uh, an emerge another other problems. Yes, also a very important point. Thank you for. Um, uh, yes, okay, maybe you can still say something very briefly, but then we really have to close it down because there will be another session, I think, here in in ten fifteen minutes. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Asnaka from Ethiopia. Uh, I have one question due to, you know, uh, the Tigrayan and the Ethiopian uh, war during the crisis. The Tigrayan uh, the purely of, uh, devastated and looted a lot of internet service from local area of Gondor, Shoa and other provinces of Ethiopia. But the international community, uh, radio and TV broadcast never Status about the, that condition. Only they complain about Ethiopian side. So everybody should have balanced the uh, right way, neutrality and stability of um, the media. So the media has diversified the true ones rather than the, lay the false ones propagated. So you have to the background of real information about that. 
because the Tibetan people are disinformed due to that war. So never any kind of media as such condition that releases the information. Okay, so you have you to so balance much. it. Yes, so the topic of public interest content and media content, of course, is also very relevant. I will quickly repeat the points that we just heard and then make a quick round with all panelists to touch upon whatever points you find um, relevant and then I will try to close it with some cl conclusions. So the first um, question was pointing to the question of the role of third parties um, and human rights content governance um, tools that could be developed by uh, software providers, um, referring also to interoperability. The second point was focusing on the limits um, of freedom of expression in line with international human rights and specifically the question of proportionality. The third question was um, the less attention, um, not only in the resources, but also in the reporting of global um, platforms when it comes to regional, um, to specific regions around the globe. The fourth point was on how we can address deep fakes. I'm afraid we will not be able to respond to that in 20 seconds, but it's a very crucially important point. And um, then we also had a comment on um, public interest content and, and, and media information. And the last point was the question of state of emergencies and whether there might be also some crisis protocols leading to giving platform specific different obligations depending on whether we are in a state of crisis or not. Eliska, please, you can start. Wow, okay. Um, so with the first question, um, I think that you are referring to, um, for instance, the idea of third-party content recommender systems that could be achieved through interoperability measures. And by the way, the interoperability provision is in Digital Market Act. We never succeeded to push for it in Digital Services Act. So that's one of our painful losses in that fight. But indeed, that, uh, um, that uh, topic still remains on the table for civil society. It's a major priority uh, to explore those options, especially also also when it comes to independence of media, and as you know, if you put it in the context of EU legislation, there is a new regulation on media freedom coming up where we will look for avenues how to push for that. Um, and of course, if uh, third-party content recommender systems developed by uh, civil society organizations, for instance, with relevant expertise uh, that are done for smaller communities uh, based on community standards that much more reflect your values and interests. In that way, you as a user gain more empowerment and control over how your newsfeed is being organized and it really reflects your set of values. So for us, from our perspective as a digital rights organization, it's a win-win situation and we're not giving up, to say, to say the least. Uh, regarding the research that was mentioned, uh, I think it was uh, someone on this side, I would love to receive those resources. If please don't hesitate to reach out and we can connect on that and discuss further. We are super interested for sure. Um, and regarding the issue of internet shutdown, I couldn't agree more that freedom of expression is not an absolute right. And there are legitimate restrictions based on international human rights law, as you rightly pointed out, necessity and proportionality. But I personally have a hard time to believe that internet shutdowns uh, as um, extremely um, far-reaching measure would meet those criteria prescribed by international human rights law. However, there is a number of recommendations put forward how to uh, legitimately combat uh, the spread of disinformation and other negative societal phenomena that are manifested online. Access Now also put forward a number of recommendations, international human rights bodies, uh, and even courts, an international human rights court that you also mentioned, uh, very much explain what it means to establish a human rights-centric content governance uh, framework. Um, and these measures should be definitely applicable first instead of such a, a rough measure as internet shutdown in our view. Um, regarding the comment on the uh, special crisis response mechanisms, um, actually, um, indeed, it does exist now even under European legal framework where we have a uh, where you know the EU can request special set of measures from very large pl online platforms once the crisis escalates, but we have to be very careful with those measures and how they are being implemented and who has the main oversight and enforcement power to decide what those extraordinary measures should be and uh, uh, even who actually defines what is the crisis and when the status of crisis occur. It might be the right way, but with appropriate safeguards in place. Um, and there is definitely much more to say, but I'll stop there because I'm sorry, I'm speaking for too long. <laughs> 
No, thank you so much. Um, Matthias, Tatiana, do you want to add something? Please, Matthias, you unmuted yourself. Very so briefly, please. <laughs> echoing, echoing, of course, uh, what, what the previous speaker said. And perhaps adding to the point, I really, really think the idea of ensuring more community engagement is so important. There are a number of essential new developments in that regard, including the construction of platform councils, which have their flaws, but which can be used to increase the input and the output legitimacy of rules of platforms, either through experts or even better through community engagement, as uh, UNESCO has done in a recent project, uh, Social Media for Good, for instance. Um, it's really important to get the people, uh, those who are uh, who are involved, who, who are well suffering or at least influenced by how platforms moderate, they have to be involved in setting the rules, culturally sensitive, linguistically sensitive, appropriate to the demands of the local discourses. Thank you, Tatiana. Also, two sentences you want to add? Uh, yeah, actually, I will try to be very, very brief. Uh, I wanted to comment on the shutdowns, uh, like my answer, the person coming from the uh, conflict affected region, it is absolute no, if it is used as a tool for content restriction, because I cannot imagine the situation when it can be proportionate. But sometimes it can be proportionate, like for a very short period of time when military operation takes place in a particular region or like in a particular localized area but only for the purposes of that operation so it is never justified as a content restriction from my perspective also the question regarding neutrality is always interesting for me just because um i from, from the start of the full-scale invasion i drew this very strict line in my head between the content stemming from the aggressor state and content stemming from the defendant state and the social media started doing so the main reason is that for example when we are speaking about propaganda for war or propaganda for violence for the aggressor state it is a, a manifestation of illegal aggression for the defendant state it is the only mean to safeguard sovereignty so if the actions of violence can be taken in self-defense the question, and this question remains open still, is whether the call for self-defense with resort to violence would be legitimate under the freedom of expression standards. And that's what social media are now trying to address. If individuals from the defendant state are constantly publishing the calls to kick the aggressors off from their territory, whether that would be the call for violence, and if yes, whether it is justified and shall remain available on the platform. And finally, regarding the question from the colleague from Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, I think that in cases of emergency, it is very important uh, to uh, have the pre-developed crisis protocol, which can be adjusted to the local circumstances, rather than to develop the response on spot and uh, doing it in the way like mistakes, tries, attempts, something is successful, something is not. So the framework has to be pre-established and further on it is adjusted to the development situation. Thank you so much. That's it from my side. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Tatiana. Yeah. And maybe just to add that this is not only your legal assessment, but I think also the special um, procedures of the UN Special Rapporteur and others have already uh, indicated that complete internet shutdowns are basically never proportionate. So this is not an assessment by yourself, but also shared um, internationally. So you have the pleasure to uh, round the up some final words because I w uh, before I will close this, please, what do you want to add, Mara? I literally forgot. Uh, but I think, yeah, uh, I guess for the third party uh, providers, I guess for me it is problematic if they're based in restrictive authoritarian settings, which create a lot of lack of transparency and culture of impunity. So as long as there is public transparency regarding the third party providers, then we can still negotiate that. And I guess regarding the African reporting um, and why is it less, um, yeah, um, is it less common than other regions? I guess first because of the languages that we have on the continent. Second, because of uh, the lack of digital literacy. So a lot of organizations, they don't know how to report. 
they, don't, they can't really access to the reporting mechanisms. Uh, something to push forward with um, social media platforms or like the oversight board of Meta, which is currently working on that specifically. And um, yeah, I think um, also for um, the deep fakes, I guess they're really changing the course of the war, creating a lot of polarization. And uh, this is something to, to take on consideration when we're talking about also content governance. And I think it's, it's a conversation to have on its own, as uh, Julia said. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you. There are a few points that I want really, in closing, just to summarize. First, we need proactive responses. We need crisis protocols that are based on due diligence and human rights impact assessment that are consistent, that are um, transparent, and that are developed ahead of crisis. We need um, content governance to be rooted in human rights and local context, and we need meaningful engagement and sustained efforts um, that are really protected through regulatory frameworks that are focusing on the processes and not on the content, so focusing on reach and not speech. Um, thank you all so much. We will really take this um, forward also in the OACE. Please take a copy of the gui policy guidance that we have developed so far and that we are now really, based on all of your feedback and the great contributions we received today, develop further in the context of how states should be really implementing um, free speech safeguards in the context of crisis, pre, during and post crisis to ensure that we all can um, that it's conducive to our digital rights and that we can communicate freely. Thank you again, and please stay in touch, and please take one of the copies. Thanks. And thanks also to online. Recording in progress.